worship. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God don't need our worship. He is holy before we started even to worship. He's worthy without our worship. But raise your hands. Let's give him the first fruit of the morning. Father, we bless your name. We worship you, O oh God. Your name over our lives is an everlasting name. O oh God, we are so aware that you are the immutable one, the never dying one, the eternal one, the dateless, the timeless one. And we bow our spirits before you and give you all the praise and all the glory and all the adoration. May your name be forever and forever, even into our generations. Your name will be established. We worship you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's a great day in the Lord. Um, let me read the scripture to you this morning. First Thessalonians 5. On behalf of our host here this morning, Thamo and Marolan. Uh, please feel, feel welcome in the presence of the Lord and the brothers um, as we prepare our hearts and uh, to listen and to hear and to take in what God, God has in store for us this day. Um, I'm reading from the Logos translation. Uh, I apologize if you don't have this translation. The day of the Lord but concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourself know accurately that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, just as labor pains upon the woman that is pregnant, and they shall be by no means escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But we... Since we are, the, we are of the day, let us be sober, putting on a breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to the obtaining of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, in order that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you always are doing. And we request of you, brothers, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and instruct you, and to regard them beyond all measure in love because of their work. Be at peace amongst yourself. Now we exhort you, brothers, admonish the disorderly, encourage the discouraged, be supportive of the weak, be patient towards all, See that no one pay back evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue that which is good both for one another and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do this. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with all holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord for this letter to be read to all the holy brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and everybody say amen. Um, the focus is the day of the Lord and um, the coming of the Lord is the, the next focus. Um, 
I, I grew up in this environment where the coming of the Lord was just a, for us a single event. Um, just a single event. Um, and, um, but I, as I came into the apostolic season and, and I start to mature in the scriptures and understanding, I start to realize that uh, he came, that he will come, and he will continue coming. And so, meaning that the coming of the Lord is no more a single event for us. Just by sitting here in this new economy, what we call the apostolic season, you must look at it, discern it, and see and recognize that this is the coming of the Lord on the earth. It is a new and a fresh manifestation of the Lord in the earth. And uh, I just want to encourage you as we will listen, listening this week to the speakers, uh, that we will lift up our spirits and not to hear man speaking, but to see the Lord himself is with us and the Lord is speaking to his church, declaring that a new coming of the Lord has dawned upon the face of the earth. The horizon has changed, my brothers. Uh, we see things clearly now. And when you look at the horizon, you must see a new manifestation uh, of the Lord on the horizon. I want to focus you on this. He said that he comes, this coming, he said this coming will be like a thief in the night. And we know that thieves, uh, when they come, it is unexpected. Meaning whenever there's a new move of God on the horizon, a new coming of the Lord, that coming will always be unexpected. But he said that we are, you are not children of, of or sons of the darkness, you are sons of light, meaning that you are supposed to be up there in the spirit to know and discern that this is the coming of the Lord uh, to us in this time. Now, uh, Christ manifests in different forms. Maybe he will not come in a form that we, we are familiar with or in a form that we are expecting to come, but he will come and he has come. Now, the Bible said we must make sure when he comes that we, it, it comes as a thief in the night, but we must not be asleep uh, in this day now. And he said, he made this statement. He said, um, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. I realize this is not a glass of wine that Paul is talking about here. Um, this is a sleeping that has now come over the church. Uh, he said that we must not be drunk, uh, meaning uh, when, when there's a drunkenness upon the church, that we, 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 do, we do not have the ability, uh, the spiritual ability to discern the new comings of the Lord to us. And the drunkenness here, the, that we are intoxicated uh, with... Uh, um, uh, intoxicated with uh, false doctrines and when you are intoxicated with false doctrines your soul is unstable your soul is drowsy uh, and when you drowsy you cannot discern the movements of God and right now the church is asleep the church is drunk and the uh, uh, drunk and you study the word night the word night there the thief comes uh, uh, the, the comings of the Lord is like a thief in the night that word night there means uh, uh, it's like moral foolishness that has come upon the church and there's a darkness there's a night that has fallen upon the church and the souls of the saints are unstable right now when the saints are drowsy because they are drunk with entertainment they are drunk with moral uh, foolishness in the church they are drunk uh, right now in the church with uh, material things and all these things that is happening in the church and because of that the church cannot discern when a new move of God comes into the earth. How many times did you try to speak out there this message and it is like they are in a trance. They don't know what you are saying. You try your very best. You gave them Tamu series. You give them Dr. Seki series. They can't understand what you, are, what you are saying because their souls are drunk and unstable because of the night that has come upon them. Drunkenness, it is not a glass of wine here, but it is... Uh, uh, it is a spirit of deception that has fallen upon the church. And right now the church is right there at that place. But, uh, and we see on the present order of the church, that night has come because of the spirit uh, of entertainment and moral foolishness that has come upon the face of the earth. 
I'm saying all these things so that we must stay in that position to be awake, to see, to discern the comings, the speakings of the Lord on the horizon and that we must not miss it. Uh, and the coming of the Lord uh, is the coming uh, that we will be clearly see that the Lord is here. And right now I know uh, that the apostolic season, if I can say it more clearly, that the apostolic season is the coming of the Lord. There's an appearance of Christ through his apostles, through his prophets, speaking to us. You must lift your discernment levels to understand and to see this. But as I was reading this chapter, I could clearly see that Paul is giving us a picture of how to stay awake and how to be fit in the spirit that this night will not overtake us. Uh, give us a picture as like an alarm system that must be built in us and not be and always be activated in us and I believe the reason why you are here into this new season why you made it into the new season is because of this system that is already in you now let me give you the elements here uh, I think uh, quickly he said this actually this whole verse is about this alarm system that must be in us. But one of it was, for the sake of time, he said, rejoice always. And he said, pray, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Abstain from every form of evil. Now, I said, do not... Do not, uh, uh, I said, pray without ceasing. I, um, meaning that we must maintain an un, uninterrupted and a constant spirit of prayer. Uh, prayer is not locking myself up somewhere in a room. It is a, it is a, um, it is an attitude that must always be there in the church. Now I notice whenever there's a lack of prayer, there's a lack of humility in the body of Christ. When you, when you pray, it's a statement that you are saying to the Lord, I'm so vulnerable, I cannot without you. And that, that, that brings a spirit of humility upon us. And the church has lost this humility. And therefore, when the seasons come, uh, they cannot see the Lord because they have lost their humility. The church has lost the spirit of prayer. And I'm very much concerned about the spirit of prayer because this is right now the weakness in the church that the church has stopped praying uh, and we are relying on the self and we are, we are relying on our achievements to take us forward. But prayer is, a, prayer, prayer is an attitude and we must, we must not be paralyzed by the, the spirit of deception that is right now upon the church and lose the spirit of prayer uh, in the church. Prayer help us to, to keep the softness, uh, the tenderness in our hearts uh, when the Lord speaks, the tenderness is there, the softness in our hearts is there to hear the Lord when the Lord is speaking. And so we must keep, this is part of our alert system in the spirit. We must never stop praying. Right now, the church have lost this. And uh, the, the alertness is that whenever there's a new sayings, a new speakings of the Lord we, on the horizon, we immediately we can discern this. And the last one here, uh, before we go to the table, he said, rejoice. And he said always, and I think it was Paul saying in Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, I, th I think, I don't know how to pronounce this, this Habakkuk. Hab Habakkuk. Uh, um, he said, although the fig tree shall not blossom. And then he gave uh, some other external things. And then he said, uh, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Uh, rightfully, Dr. Segi was explaining, he said there's a difference between happiness and, and, and joy. And then I look at it, I said, yes, Lord, that's so true. That's a, uh, because when, when the external things are there, no, listen, a, a, a new car can make you happy. A new house can make you happy. But don't confuse happiness with the, with the joy of the Lord. Because the joy of the Lord is a, is a heavenly deposit. It is something that is only find, found in Christ himself. It is like an understream. It's a secret waterfall that is deep in your soul. 
where you, and this is totally independent from happiness because if, if the fig tree will not blossom, yet I will still rejoice in the Lord, meaning that my joy is independent from my happiness. I can go on in life without happiness, but I cannot live without joy because joy is a, is a, is a heavenly resource that God has given unto his church. And we must never lose that joy in Christ. Right now, the church is bankrupt of this spirit of joy. And we need the material things to go on. We need something to fix us, to make us happy. Listen, we, I'm not saying that we don't need happiness, but we, the church needs joy. Uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength in this day, and not the material things. Uh, some of us will never get our hands on a new car. Some of us, God will never give us a new house. But joy comes in the morning. Joy is our strength in the Lord. And we must keep this part of your alarm system in the Lord. We must never lose this vital resource called the joy of the Lord. We must never lose this, the, the joy of the Lord. And he said, quench not the spirit. Um, uh, meaning that um, we must not allow the, the lust of the flesh. We must never uh, allow the, the case of life uh, to quench uh, the spirit of the Lord. He said, do not grieve the spirit of the Lord. And we must cherish uh, the spirit of the Lord. And he said, the last one here is, uh, is prophecy that we must not despise it. I look back over the years um, and I look how God has maneuvered uh, this house of Tamu through the years. And I start to realize the vital, vital uh, 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 part and resource of the apostolic spirit amongst us how the apostolic has helped us to come and to journey to this point. And I look back last night and I said, Lord, if it wasn't for the apostolic spirit amongst us, uh, we could have, uh, there were so many detours in our road, but God, you have kept us because of that spirit. And we must never despise the, the prophetic spirit that is amongst us. This is just uh, words of encouragement because darkness will come and continue come on the church. And we must keep our alertness right there. When we see the Lord and a new manifestation of the Lord on the horizon, then the church will be ready to receive the Lord in the earth as we are rightly doing it now. Let us all stand. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this gathering, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you, uh, that you have called your sons all over the world to come and stand before you. Like Jacob, O oh God, ordered his sons to come and stand before him to listen to the speakings so that you can declare our future in you unto your body, O oh God. And we stand ready, Father, to hear the speakings of our Father, O oh God. O oh Lord, as we stand, Father, we pray that you will break down the things, O oh God, that you are uh, uh, in our lives, O oh God, that you are not right now, Father, comfortable with and happy with, Father, we open ourselves, we prostrate our spirits before you, and we give you the right to deal with the inaccurate parts in us. We give you the right, Father, O oh God, to demolish. We give you the right to cut out, O oh God, anything. We stand before you in a spirit of humility and say, Lord, do whatever you want to do. We are ready, O oh God, for your speaking, Father. Confront, O oh God, the erroneous systems in our minds punish the disobedience that is in us oh god we bow father we lay down our lives and we will allow you father that your life will grow in us because we are the sons of the light oh god that your life oh god is radiating through us oh god so that the nations oh god can find their way through a church oh god that will stand in the brilliant light of the lord in this last hour we bless you know bless this gathering oh god in jesus name you may, you may partake. God bless you. Because oh, I know, Lord, your plan for me is
precious name. Are you ready to surrender, to separate, to live a life distinctly dedicated to him? Or greet somebody around you, say hello to them. Make sure you're comfortable with your environment. Good morning. Are you ready for day two of the Apostolic School of Ministry? So say to your neighbor, this is not a conference. Say to your neighbor, I emphasize this is not a conference. And don't you ever think it's a conference. Say to your neighbor, this is an apostolic school. A school. Pinch your neighbor and say, school. It's a school. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I have to brainwash you. <laughs> because in church, we like to come and just, you know, do our stuff. But welcome, welcome to the school. And while you're not sitting behind a desk, in the spirit, you're sitting at his feet. You've come to learn, to receive instruction to make adjustments and corrections and um, to prepare, prepare ourselves, for, as Gordon said, for the comings of the Lord. There are many, many comings before he appears uh, before us and we see him face to face. We're looking forward to the day when we'll see him face to face. Are you looking forward to that day? But before he appears to us, he will appear in us in various ways. And as Gordon said, and if you noticed, it says the day of the Lord. It didn't say the Lord will come. It said the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Read the scriptures right. Okay? The day will come with the element of surprise. And the day of the Lord is the day of Kairos. It's when the light of his revelation appears to us in a certain way where we all believe that the Lord will come, we also believe in the comings before that final event, which we all look forward to. So welcome, welcome. A special welcome to those that have not uh, really extended a welcome yesterday morning. How many of you have come after yesterday morning? Just put your hands up. Right up. Welcome to all of you. Welcome, we trust that you're blessed. And, um, but a special welcome to our special guest. Uh, Yasser Rivas is no, is no guest to us, he's a son of our house. But welcome to Yasser Rivas, very busy in, in tra traveling the Spanish world. But to him, with him has come two very special people who, who had a whole network of churches in different parts of the Spanish world, and, f and they function as apostles and fathers over these uh, churches all over Europe, into Latin America, etc. cetera. Um, they are from Colombia, but live in the United States of America. Maria Esther and Basilio, and the surnames are Patino. Please stand. Let's extend a warm welcome to them. And contrary to popular belief, if you live in the United States, it does not mean you speak English. <laughs> After all, it's a, it's a nation of aliens. <laughs> and their first language is Spanish, just a few words in English they do understand. But we want to extend a very warm welcome to you. And we're so privileged to have you with us. And in you is represented your whole family of churches. 
May the Lord bless you. All right, are you ready for the first session? And as is, it is customary, the one that finishes last night starts the next morning. And, uh, and how you finish is how you start. Okay? And how you start, we don't know how we'll finish. <laughs> but let's put our hands together for Dr. Segi as he comes to share with us. Well, a very good morning to you. Again, what a privilege it is for me uh, to talk to you about a few things. And thank God this is a school, so there's, uh, it's not going to be preaching, but more explaining. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us as we go through today. And I've been talking yesterday about the, the Jebusite, uh, the mentality of the Jebusite, uh, the mentality to trample down, to trample down. Uh, people, to make people worthless, to, to bring ruination, to bring pollution, to make people inferior, to bring class distinctions in the church. And so I ended with how to deal with the spirit of the Jebusite. And I uh, just want to repeat a few things because I feel they're very important. And we found out yesterday that there are several principles in scripture to defeat the Jebusite. And I read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 5, the Bible says that all the tribes of Israel came to David at Ebron and spoke saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. I shared with you last night how important the set man principle is that the people, the tribes of Israel came to David. They did not come to the institution. They did not come to the elders. They came to a specific person. Now, maybe we are rejoicing in the fact that today we can so easily share these messages. When I first spoke about set man in our own city, there was war. Uh, we, we faced uh, an immense battle in our, in our city as denominations came against us, as elders came against us. There was actually violence in the city because people rejected the doctrine of the set man. And this is uh, very important to understand also the migration of the doctrine of the set man. That the set man is the father of the house. We understand that migration, and that is a separate topic. But it's important to understand that those in the household of faith must have a direct relationship with the David of the house. They must have a direct relationship with the carrier of grace. That the set man must not be a mythical figure in the house who comes in with a spotlight on him and he comes after the singing and the music and he comes from somewhere in the back, he suddenly appears on the stage and everyone think of him as a mythical figure who who's so powerful and so mystical, sometimes you think that he does not use ablution facilities. <laughs> the set man is a normal human being. He's been sent by God, appointed by God. He's a man of relationship, a man of experience, man of revelation, man of passion for God. He's able to access the voice of the Lord. That's very important. And he has a dream to build God's house. That's his passion, to build God's house. He's a David of the house. And uh, I've shared extensively in previous schools how this is the methodology. This is the operating system of God, that whenever God operates, he chooses a man. In the Old Testament, he would choose Moses. And after Moses, he would choose Joshua. There was no co-regency. He would choose, operate with one man, and the others had to follow. It's a very simple 
principle. It's then the New Testament. It was Timothy at Ephesus, Titus at Crete, Barnabas at Antioch, James at Jerusalem. And even if you go and look at the book of Revelation, Jesus wrote to the angel of the church, the set man of the church. He never wrote to the elders. He never wrote to the deacons. He never wrote to the congregation. He wrote to the one man. And that's how many secular institutions operate. You go to the school, there's a principal in the school. You go to the hospital, there is a superintendent in the hospital. You go to the Kruger National Park, check out the elephants, there's a bull elephant. <laughs> you go to the, check the monkeys out, there's an alpha male. So it's, it's a universal principle, so folks should get used to that. The quicker you get used to that, the less trauma you're going to have in your journey. So the Lord has set a man, set man, and he's a David, and uh, he's a mature man, 30 years of age, a number of sonship. A man is able to confer his mantle, his graces, is able to confer prosperity because Abraham was a set man. When Lot joined Abraham, Lot prospered. Uh, Jacob was a set man, and Abraham acknowledged that his prosperity was because of Jacob in his house. Joseph was a set man, and Joseph brought prosperity to an entire nation. Uh, David was a set man. If you study David's life, the Bible says weak, debilitated, depressed men joined David, and a few chapters later, they become mighty men. So the set man confers prosperity, confers a protection, protective mantle over the house, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So this is a very powerful grace. It's an asset grace. The greatest asset of a local house is its set man, its leader. And we do not have time to go through the gender issues. We know that in Christ there's neither male nor female. And we have many churches where that are led by, by women. So we don't want to go there. We understand the principle that we are partakers not of gender, but we are partakers of grace. The set man confers protection. And you know that when Moses left, uh, the people built golden calves because his protective mantle was removed. Set man brings personality to the church. For instance, an Elijah personality is a personality of confrontation a personality of accessing the still small voice, a personality of shunning, of shunning fame, because Elijah, Elijah took the mantle and wrapped it around his face. He wanted to be faceless. So there's a personality that a set man carries, and he confers that personality into the house. A set man brings, uh, makes you a participant in the heavenly vision. In Acts chapter 16, the Bible says that Paul saw the vision and the rest of them then partook of the vision that Paul had received. And there are set man prerogatives. These are all very important. We need to cover this regularly in, in our churches. Uh, in our city, we, had, we used to have a history of split churches. There's one particular church split 17 times. Many other churches have been I've been regularly experiencing splits, but I want to say to you that after the teaching on the set man, we rarely have split churches in our city today because of the order that has come into the city. So set man has prerogatives. He can appoint his elders. He knows who to relate to, network with other pastors. He has the authority and prerogative to gather the body, to establish the budget, to lead, to oversee the house, and he has the, the, he can operate with sanction and veto. All of those are set man rights and set man prerogatives. And there's a way that uh, uh, those in the house must relate to the set man. Uh, there are sins against the set man, sins of bypass, sins of trespass, sins of supersession, disloyalty, disconnection, those are all serious infractions in this present season of Reformation. And for us to come to this location of building accurately, uh, one of the first doctrines that we must be familiar with 
is the doctrine of the set man, the David in the house. And how that has shifted now as the individual now becomes a corporate because the mentality of the leader becomes imprinted in all those that follow him. So there's a multiplicity of Davids in the city. So that's a corporate reality. That's where the movement is going to. And so when you meet such a man in the city, uh, you have to uh, recognize the value of covenant. God is a covenant keeping God, covenant enabling God. And the great challenge is while we understand how set man operates in terms of a local church, we must know how set man operates in terms of cities. And I believe the same principle applies. God raises a man in the city and it's important to be able to discern to see who the person is and to know how to covenant with that person for the deliverance of cities. This is a season where cities are going to be delivered. In the charismatic season, you cast out demons from individuals. In the apostolic season, we cast out demons from cities. This is, this is different from an individualistic gospel of the charismatic season. So the issue of covenant and here we see the city elders come and they anoint David and, uh, and they make a covenant with David. And uh, I shared with you yesterday about the principle of the water shaft and how important that principle is in dismantling the Jebusite. Uh, understanding particularly uh, proceeding word, this preceding word and this proceeding word word. Uh, this, this kind of thinking has been alien, particularly to those who have been in Bible schools in the 1980s, 1990s, to be able to decode scripture symbolically, particularly if you come from a dispensational background, oftentimes the damage is so significant that it is very difficult to even think symbolically. Let me show you symbolically how the water shaft principle operates. In Isaiah 52, verses 1 to 3, carrying on with where Gordon left off, and Gordon spoke prophetically, and it says, Awake, awake. And that's a great challenge we have because the, the last season, the last season has lulled the church has lulled the church into, into inactivity. The church developed Delilah relationships. And the church went into the valley of Sorek. I'm talking particularly of the charismatic church. Went into the valley of Sorek and found itself fast asleep on the lap of Delilah. And the church was given an urkat by Delilah. Lost its anointing. Lost its power. And uh, the word of the Lord to us is awake, awake. And so a lot of people have got up from that slumber. But they find themselves lying on the same bed. And this is the great challenge that we face. When pastors have woken up but they're lying on the same bed and now the bed is too small. So the legs are hanging over the bed and the blanket is too small. So they are find themselves in a place of great frustration. Sleeping on a small bed is very frustrating. So the Bible says awake, awake. And this does not apply only historically to Babylonian captivity we must see it prophetically as being more relevant to us than it was historically. We must understand as, as Gordon said, a large portion of the church is still fast asleep. And he says, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. The Bible says, put on your strength. And our strength is not in material things. 
Our strength is in our beautiful garments. And the Bible says the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints. Our strength is the righteousness of Christ. And we don't want to elaborate on that. That in itself will take a couple of days. That is our strength. We battle through the breastplate of righteousness. And it says for the unclean, the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. So this cannot apply only historically to Israel because we know that after Babylon, the unclean still came. We know the Medo-Persians came, the Grecians came, the Romans came in. So its greater application is to Zion, is to the end time church where the unclean will no longer be able to enter into that location. Therefore, I say to you, that in city churches that have a Zion mentality, that have the habitat of God, we are no longer scared of false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, etc., or even false brethren. We bring them into the habitat, and they find themselves very uncomfortable in that habitat. And so they run away before they can cause any problems. That's why the habitat is so important. Crafting the habitat of apostolic culture, which is a habitat that maintains itself. You don't have to find yourself as a pastor visiting people to maintain them. The habitat maintains them. It says, put on your strength. And it says, shake yourself from the dust. Shake yourself from what the Jebusite has done. The fact that he has trampled over you, has placed you on the threshing floor, and has covered you with dust. Time has come for us to shake ourselves from all that institutions have imposed upon us. And the Bible says, arise. The word arise is such a powerful word. It means change your position, change your posture. And then it says, sit down. But this time you don't sit on the earth, but you sit at the right hand of God. As a Benjamin gener generation, the Bible says, He who overcomes shall sit with me on my throne. And this Jebusite mentality, the mentality that has come, that has been within institutionalized religion, that has oppressed believers, that has trampled over them, God asks us to arise from that situation. Sit down, O Jerusalem. And the word of God says, loose yourself from the bonds of your neck. This is a season of self-deliverance. You can deliver yourself. By just sitting in the house, no one has to pray for you. Just take the word of God, apply it to yourself, and you will get delivered. That's how easy deliverance is in an apostolic paradigm. He sent his word and healed them. A word is good medicine. It will sort your problems out. It will deliver you. Like the word has always delivered me. And the word has always been a great blessing to me. It says, loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you have sold yourself for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. And I refer you to just go and process that with what Sean started off on the first day we would not go further into that so it's very important to understand to defeat this Jebusite you need the water shaft you need to know how to accurately divide the word of God how to come to an accurate understanding of present truth you need the set man but it's not only the set man because the Bible says in 2nd Samuel chapter 5 verse 6 and the king and his men that means a set man and his men you need team ministry principles. The company arising together, working together, went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David saying, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. So the whole shift is from the singular to the plural. From the individual to the corporate. Moving from David to a Davidic team. And of course, the next important principle, 2 Samuel chapter 5, 
Uh, it says, verse number 10, so David went on and became great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. Very, the quintessential principle is the presence of the Lord. The manifest presence of the Lord. I urge you to go and process that further. How the presence of the Lord is so important in your migration to dominion and to your house, your city becoming great. God's intent is the church must be great. The end time church is a great church. It's not a defeated church waiting, waiting to fly away, waiting to disappear. It's a powerful church. I want you to know when we interpret scripture and you think of in the Bible says that that day shall not come except the come of falling away first. Now falling away is not the bride of Christ. There's two churches. There's a harlot and the bride. The harlot is getting worse and worse. But the bride is getting better and better. And the bride will be great. The church will be great. Now a very important uh, uh, principle in the deliverance from the Jebusite is to understand Melchizedek. And you know that Melchizedek was king and priest of Salem. But prior to that, Salem was known as Jebus. Or after that, Salem was known as Jebus. So, the original king of the Jebusites was Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a leader in Jerusalem, also called Salem, called Jebus. And the Bible says that after Abraham defeated those kings, Melchizedek came to meet him, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. It is also important to realize what blessing means. The lesser cannot bless the greater. There is a necessity for understanding that principle that it's the greater that blesses the lesser. So Melchizedek blessed Abraham. What was this blessing when a greater blesses the lesser that means there's an impartation of the spirit of the greater into the lesser. So, when Melchizedek blessed Abraham and Abraham left Melchizedek, something happened to Abraham. He began to walk in a Melchizedek dimension. He began to operate not only as a priest. You must understand that Abraham built altars, functioned as a priest, but after Melchizedek encounter, he now moved into a kingly dimension. Let me read this to you. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high and blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tithe of all. This is, this is such an important principle in terms of understanding tithing. In terms of what Kevin Connor calls the first mention principle. First mentioned principle is seminal form and contains a very important truth. And you'll notice here that Abraham, in terms of his celebration and relating to Melchizedek, released his tithe to a person. That's the first mention of tithing. It was released to a person. Because of Jebusitic damage in the church, over a number of years, the tithe now goes to the wrong location. 
the tithe goes to the institution and there is no one that can prove from scripture that the tithe must go to an institution. The tithe must go to a person who is after the order of Melchizedek. In terms of the first mentioned principle, if you are a student of hermeneutics, you will understand that this is a very important principle to study a doctrine at the time of its inception. Like we heard yesterday, yesterday when you talk about worship, it has nothing to do like the way we operate today in terms of musical instruments. Because the definition of worship in terms of his first mentioned principle as Steve mentioned is that worship is obedience. So there's no evidence in scripture that the tithe goes to an institution. And I know that those countries that practice it like Germany and Switzerland where you are not given an opportunity as Malachi says, God said, bring the tithe. In Germany and in Switzerland, they don't bring the tithe, they take the tithe. So if you don't want the government to take the tithe, you have to write a letter to them stating that you are now an atheist, so they won't take the tithe from your account. But the tithe has to be brought and particularly, I know I'm speaking to pastors today, that your tithe must go to your Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is, in inverted commas, the storehouse. The Bible says, bring the tithe to the storehouse. The storehouse was a room in the temple that contained all the tithes, but it was exclusively for the Levites. It was given to a certain group of people. We know that in the New Testament, the temple is the body of Christ, and within the body of Christ, there are those that demonstrate the Levitical principle, carry the Melchizedek principle, and they, are the, they should be the recipients of the tithe. So the set man of the house is a storehouse, is the recipient of the tithe, is the owner and distributor of the tithe. And of course, uh, uh, you don't have to worry if that, if that set man is an evil set man, the tithe will destroy him. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about him becoming a billionaire. <laughs> he'll have a billion, but he'll never be able to spend a cent. But you've got to get this principle right. That the tithe testifies of your faithfulness. The tithe, ide you identify with Abraham. The tithe, the Bible says, honors God. The tithe establishes the storehouse. So there will be meat in the house. So when you bring the tithe, and when the tithe is received, the end result of that is there is meat in the house. A lot of houses have no meat. They're just dealing with milk. Because you think this, this thing can be accessed by just studying your wrong. Because the Bible tells us there, if you go and read it carefully, when... Abraham released his tithe to Melchizedek. It says, and after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. The word of the Lord will not come to you in all its efficiency, in all its power, in all its glory. If you as a set man of your local house don't know how to deal with the tithe. So, Abraham released his tithe to Melchizedek, he released, this was a covenant, and the covenant with Melchizedek was followed by a divine covenant. The Bible says in Genesis 15, 8, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And he said to him, 
bring me a three-year-old alpha, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, uh, etc. If you read that entire passage there, Genesis 15, the covenant with Melchizedek was followed by the divine covenant. In Genesis 15, 8, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Etites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And we understand that in covenant, the covenant of Ab the Abrahamic Melchizedek covenant included Abraham's descendants. And it included land ownership. And land ownership is evidence symbolically of dominion. He who owns the land dictates the policy. So within that covenant, God said, to your descendants I have given the land. Isaac and Jacob were included in the covenant. The Levites were included in the covenant. The Bible says the Levites gave tithes in Abraham's bosom and were included. Those who are of the seed of Abraham, that's us, we are also included in that covenant. So Abraham took, Mel rather Melchizedek took Abraham with him and Abraham took Melchizedek with him. That was what was happening in that, that brief encounter there. It's the same like Christ in you and you in Christ. So Abraham carries on with his business and Melchizedek after that encounter of bread and wine he goes back to Jebus land, he goes back to Salem, he goes back to Jerusalem, and he takes a part of Abraham with him. What was in Abraham was Isaac, was Jacob, and, and so some of the rabbis say that he took some covenantal idols with him. Now, the rabbis say that Isaac was blind and Jacob was lame. You remember the wrestling with God. Hello, you remember that? And he was walking with a limp. So the rabbis say Isaac was blind and Jacob was lame. So when Melchizedek went back to the land of Jebus, it is believed he put place some covenantal idols of Isaac and Jacob, the lame and the blind. As a statement that the land of Jebus will only respond to a king priest order. It will only respond to Melchizedek. That means Melchizedek Melchizedek installed these covenantal idols and these covenantal idols could only be removed by another Melchizedek. Moses couldn't do it because he was of the tribe of Levi. Joshua couldn't do it because he was of the tribe of Ephraim. Only a king priest could displace these covenantal idols. And along comes David after the order of Melchizedek. Because David was both a king and a priest. He was a priest because he could wear the linen effort. He was a priest, he could eat the, he could eat the, the, the showbread, which no one else could eat besides the priest. So David comes into the scene with a king-priest mentality. And if you study the story there, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, there was no battle. The Jebusites said, 
David, you can't come in here. They went up the water shaft. Something happened. The Jebusites were immediately expelled. And David came into land ownership, took possession of Zion because Jebus had to surrender to a person with a king-priest mentality. As a statement of the fact that you have come into your king-priest dimension, one of the things that will happen to you as a statement that this anointing is beginning to manifest in your life, one of the key principles is in the physical is land ownership. I've seen the poorest of pastors who have suddenly inherited land. And that is because of stepping into this dimension. Because if you had to labor for land, it's going to take you many, many years. But there's an anointing, there's a grace, there's a Melchizedek order that brings you into land ownership. Now listen to this. When David, remember the plague because David had numbered the people. And there was a plague, people were just dying on every side. And so David comes to the threshing floor which belonged to Arona, the Jebusite. And when the Jebusite saw David coming, he looked at him and he said, listen, I, I have to give you this land for free. He surrendered the land for free. But of course, David didn't want it for free. This is the Melchizedek order of dominion. And it is the Melchizedek order. Too many pastors are just operating at a priestly level. A priestly level of evangelism, reconciliation, intercession, preservation, strengthening the people with motivational speaking, teaching, and sacrificing. But they have not come into the kingly dimension. You are not just a priest, you are a royal priesthood. A lot of people hate this doctrine. They hate the mention of dominion. If you don't like it, too bad. I like it. <laughs> we were meant to rule. The Bible says in Micah, to you the former dominion will come. The sons of the earth will, the sons of God will fill the earth. The whole earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Bible says that we shall inherit the earth. The righteous shall inherit the earth. Promises to the Melchizedek order. In David's reign, the lame and the blind were not permitted to enter the temple. That means David stopped that. He says there's no way that these mentalities will come into the house of God. These mentalities had to be expelled. And then when you go into the New Testament, you see the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And he meets the greater Melchizedek. And he enters into the temple. And you meet the blind man of John chapter 9, who also is instructed to go to the water. Everything is happening at the water shaft and the greater water shaft is Christ. He is the water shaft superior to any pool. And he brings men and women into the temple. So, the way this entire Jebusite problem is going to be resolved is through a full manifestation of the Melchizedek order of leadership. I want to now quickly move on to the next enemy that we need to deal with. And the next enemy is the Girgashite. Girgashite. Everyone say Girgashite. Girgashite means one who lives in the clay. It means the clay dweller. It means one who dwells in clay soil. So this immediately conveys 
several things to us, several pictures to us. This is obviously a person that dwells in the dirt. I am very accustomed to that because we grew up in village life and we had no tarred roads. Uh, we had black, black soil, pitch black soil. And all my brothers, including myself, now we look brown, but then we were really black. <laughs> because we used to spend a lot of time from the morning till the evening playing in this black soil, playing marbles, playing top, playing all those different games that are alien to the young people today. There was a stream going down past our house. Only years later, I discovered it was a sewer. <laughs> and, and, and that's where we used to play all day. And listen, we never got sick because even the germs were scared of us. <laughs> and even today, doctors are now beginning to acknowledge that the cause of disease is over sanitization. All of us had worms regularly. <laughs> and they say having worms is necessary for your development. They say having a bit of dirt from time to time is good for you. And today, because doctors have recognized that, we now have things like fecal transplantation. For certain diseases like, uh, like Clostridia diarrhea that does not respond to medication, they do a feces transplant. Get feces from an healthy individual and they put up a drip up the other side <laughs> and it sorts out the problem. In fact, the Chinese, when the children are born, they used to give them a little bit of feces to eat because it helps recolonize the gut with all kinds of protective bacteria. But we enjoyed ourselves in the dirt. <laughs> we lived in the dirt, we played in the dirt, and in the evening we used to play hide and seek in the dark because there were no lights. <laughs> there were no lights. That we used to play hide and seek naked. It was all taking place in the dark because our bodies were so black. <laughs> but my brother used to get caught all the time because when he smiled in the dark, his teeth were so white. <laughs> he just knew where he was. But it's such a wonderful time in our lives. Always think back to those times and we think of the song, Those Were the Days, My Friend. We thought they'd never end. <laughs> Remember that beautiful song. What a wonderful song. <laughs> but we enjoyed ourselves in the dirt. But when you grow up, you can't be playing in the dirt. And the dirt is symbol symbolic of a lack of excellence. Clay dwellers lack excellence. And if you study Joseph and you study Daniel, they were people of excellence. Pharaoh declared, can we find a person like this in whom the Spirit of God is? A heathen king declares over Daniel three times. It's an excellent spirit in you. The word excellent means there's no one in your category means of a superior strain. The Bible says the name of the Lord is excellent because there's no one like him. And the Bible says whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord. That means do it in excellence. And so these dirt dwellers, these Gergeshites, lack excellence. Uh, and the Bible says there's a way to get excellence. But let, the, let the righteous smite me. Let the righteous rebuke me. It shall be an excellent oil. 
the way to get excellent, the way to get the anointing of excellence is to be connected to a righteous man or a righteous woman who can rebuke you and correct you and instruct you and get rid of the dirt. So 21st century church in its postmodernism rejects righteous instruction. So we get the church filled with dirty believers who don't know how to manage their money, who don't know how to attend church on time, who lack finesse in time management and integrity and the way they keep the documents and how you manage other people's things and how you manage your environment and how you manage your diet. All of those things are, are, are features of excellence, etiquette unwritten rules of behavior. All of that comes when you're under righteous instruction. And excellence is a quality that is developed. The Bible says, show me a man who is excellent and he will not serve before obscure men, he will serve before kings. The dirt has to be removed. And, and we go through this often, teaching people. We, I find recently that I have to teach people on how to handle pastors from the time they come to the airport. Please don't send a gagashite to pick up your guest. <laughs> we have to tell the person, when you're waiting at the airport and you see on the board the plane has landed, that's not the time to go to the toilet. Because your guests can come out and move and you could still be standing there waiting for your guest, not knowing that he has gone. I found myself in that situation many times. Lack of excellence. And then of course the person who picks you up forgets on which floor he parked. <laughs> and now for one hour you have to go around looking with him for his car. <laughs> These are scenarios we have been in often. And then the person goes into the parking lot, he forgot where he left the ticket. We have a rule when you go to pick up the guest, you take the ticket, take some chewing gum, stick it on your forehead. <laughs> When you pick up your guest, make sure he has enough petrol in the car. <laughs> At times when we have been on the fast lane and I can see the, 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 the meat on the gauge. It's coming there, it's right there, reserve, and it's going empty. It's going at 120 kilometers. The guy suddenly looks at me, Pastor, I got no petrol. <laughs> and we're on the fast lane. And that's not the only revelation he comes to. He says, Pastor, have you got 50 bucks to lend me? <laughs> that person you're sending to pick up the pastor, make sure he got a jack in his car. <laughs> Excellence has to be taught. And it has to be taught line by line. You don't take things for granted. So the Gergeshite is a dirt dweller, lacks excellence. Another symbol of dirt. Dirt is a symbol. It's a picture of the Philistine which is wallowing in mud. These are folk that live in the flesh. If they are in church, they are bound by laws and ceremonialism and ritualism and traditions. They walk in the flesh. In a Gergeshite community, there's strife and contention always. There's competition. In a Gergeshite community, there is lustfulness. Excessive desire for more than what you need. In a Gergeshite community, there are sins of 
anger and jealousy and envy. In a Girgashite community, there are regular sexual sins of fornication, adultery, and people cohabiting with each other without getting married. And they're also part of the worship team. And you know when you go into such a church, you're walked into a Girgashite community which is wallowing in the mud. And just like when I was a small boy, which is swimming in the sewer nearby. I'm talking about a reality that I've seen. These are churches that practice idolatry. There are churches that practice swinging. You can go check that word out, swinging. <laughs> Wife swapping. That's what happens in the cell meetings. There is fleshly indulgence, and these are realities of a postmodern society that has crept into the church and is masquerading as the house of God. There's nothing more than clay houses, dirt, witchcraft, manipulation. Jezebel is, in, is moving and living in that house. I've had many encounters with Gergeshite individuals who have crept in unawares. A few years ago, as someone was, was in our gathering, I never knew until he was caught out that he was involved as a, as a pastor in internet pornography trafficking operating with a pseudonym and he was targeting young girls, school going girls. And these are folk that somehow get into the house. When he got caught out, he fled. And of course, these easily go and they maneuver themselves into the Sunday schools of many churches. These are Girgashites. Indulge themselves in the flesh. There are those who come in and within a month they come to know all the wealthy people in the church. And they go on a borrowing spree. We have had these encounters. Where they borrow money from everyone, can't pay, and they then flee. Gagashites. And you must understand that the dirt and the dust is the food of the serpent. The devil lives on dust. The devil lives in the flesh. And so this community attracts demons. And you will never be able to cast out those demons because the dirt is still there. In the charismatic season, we were happy to cast out the demon, but that's not how we deal with it in the apostolic season. We don't deal with the, we don't deal with the demon, we deal with the person. Show the person how to get cleaned out. How to deal with the ceremonialism. How to deal with the acts of the flesh. How to deal with spiritual neglect. How to deal with his rebellion. How to deal with the absence of conviction. How to deal with his love for the world. His immaturity. Getting rid of the dirt. That's the task of preaching. What did Jesus say? Now you are clean through the words that I have spoken unto you. He didn't say I'll pray for you and you'll get clean. You get cleaned up through doctrine. And let me say to you, doctrine is boring. Come on now, sitting and learning about the Trinity. You try it out in your chair, see what happens. We've tried it out for 20, 20 years. You need an anointing to listen to the word of God. You need an anointing to learn doctrine. Doctrine develops your character. Doctrine is a teacher's equipment. It's a revelation of the mind of God. 
And you can only get clean, your house can only get clean through the word of God. That means without the jokes. Pure doctrine on its own can stand on its own and can clean out the people. So if you are not speaking the word of God regularly in your house and creating the appetite and engaging the spirit of God, guess what you're going to have? You're going to have Gergeshites in your church. You're going to have people that are, that, that are going to love the flesh and they're going to keep coming to, our, coming to you and asking you, Pastor, when's the next men's fellowship? When's the next women's fellowship? Because they want camp meetings for entertainment. They want music for entertainment. Because the flesh lives on entertainment. The flesh lives on all the stuff that 21st century church is delivering to the people. But you can only clean, you can only clean the house through the word of God. There's no other way to clean the house. There's no other way to clean the people of God. It's, a, it's called the washing through the word of God. And so if they're not clean, you're going to attract demons. It's a shame to have a demon in a local church. I see pastors boasting about how many demons they cast out on a Sunday morning in church. Shame on you. Sis. not supposed to be there in the first place and so the whole service you're giving the demons airtime and you're giving the people floor time so all you got in your church is airtime and floor time casting out demons in the house of God shouldn't be there in the first place But your people have attracted them. Set up the antenna. Wherever there's dirt, the snake is going to slither in. And you've got to know when the snake has come in. Because the snake is going to bring all kinds of its own operating systems. It's going to bring Jezebel systems, Absalom systems, Korah systems, Adonijah systems, Babylonian systems, Egyptian systems. And you've got to check, you've got to sit down. After a school like this, you've got to go home and sit down. And you've got to ask yourself, Lord, what kind of system... What kind of operating system, what kind of software have I got in my house? Is it Jezebelian? Is it Absalom? Is it Korah? You've got to figure these things out. And then there are more subtle manifestations. You see, the demons that manifest in your church... They are more mentally retarded demons. <laughs> you just mentioned blood of Jesus, they get excited and they start showing up. <laughs> they, they're not the clever ones. Th there are more subtle and more dangerous demons that are hiding. And, the, and the, uh, you've got to be a, a wise servant to be able to discern how folk in the church get demonized. The moment they start defaming the apostolic message, they start despising the father-son wineskin. They start despising the issue of tithing. That's not innocent. There's a snake behind it. When pride starts coming in, when they start misinterpreting what you said, when you as a pastor, you said something, but they heard something different, and then you have to sit with them and go through the tape, and they said, Pastor, I don't know how I heard something else. That's because they're listening to another voice. When demons come in, people become, become negative. And in some places, they'll forget about the congregation being demonized. The pastor is demonized. 
And the way you know he's demonized is because he doesn't want to relate to any other pastor. He only wants to have international relationships. He walks in isolation. And that church like Zephaniah says, there is none like me. That church begins to commit some reckless errors of crossing boundaries of its metron. Does not understand its metron. Does not understand priorities. Begins to consort with evil men. And there are pastors that will join Herod and Pilate to crucify Jesus. And suddenly there are illegitimate alliances in the city to destroy what God is doing. You've got to recognize how it happened. It happened because there's dirt in the house. There's only one way to get clean. Only one way is through the word of God. Well, we'll cover more of this when I have an opportunity to talk. Thank you. God bless you. applies to us here first. You know, Dr. Segi has an amazing, amazing uh, skill, a methodology of extracting from the, the allegory that is in scripture very practical examples that we all can relate with. You know, the faith is about belief, which is doctrine, and praxis, practice. And you can't extract doctrine from the word without its application. And uh, it's so easy to hear these things and say, wow, I wish somebody else was here to hear that. (laughs) But this message is for you and me. God would not give it to us if it was not for us. Okay, so let's let's be serious about upgrading. Say to your neighbor, upgrade. Okay, it's very, very important and to listen very carefully so what is being said, I've, I've, again, I want to reiterate what I said in my opening uh, statements, my introductory statements, beginning to come to the realization that those who ha- are within the season need to go through the process of reconversion. A lot of people in the season are not of the season. And many people come to every school but have not heard anything. And so we go back to our houses and we have more problems with those who are keen students of this word than those that come and sit on the periphery every Sunday. And so my prayer is that such upgrades will take place in our lives and it's going to demand a forensic inquiry, a spiritual audit which includes an inventory of behavior, attitudes, and how we present the gospel the way God expects it. So please hear these things. It's great to hear powerful insights on some subjects like, you know, tithing, etc. And yet you'll have people that will never seek to apply those things. Never. And we ask why God is not doing the things he has promised to do amongst us. Uh, So please get your hearts right. Uh, these are very, for me, these are not easy messages to get because you first search your own heart. That's how I sit there. That's how I sit there. Okay? Well, we have a break now for 30 minutes, and you will come back at 22. At 22. Is that okay? Now, use the boat for places. That's, please don't.